Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, if you're um, on the Eastern time zone. Um, we'll get started with the webinar about guidance for developing HACCP plans for specialized processes at retail in just a moment. Okay, we're going to get started. I'm Brooke Benscooter, Director of Communications for AFTO, and I'm thrilled to be hosting today's session about a project that has been three years in the making, and that is the guidance document for developing HACCP plans for specialized processes at retail. And two of the people, today I'm joined by two of the people who were pivotal in getting this project done, um, especially given the amount of time it took and so many things involved. Um, we will be providing in the chat the link to both the publication itself, which you can buy hard copies, and I'll have Joe show you what that looks like in just a minute but also you can download it for free. And in addition, we'll also have a link to the templates and the example samples of templates that are located on the AFTO website that you can download and um, customize for your own operation. Um, if you have questions, please don't hesitate to put them in the chat. We won't have a ton of time for questions, but we will try and get back to you with any answers we don't address today. In addition, after the webinar today, we will be sending you a survey and Joe and John will both talk about this as they present. What are other topics or topics that are in here that you need a deeper dive? How can we help you so we can set up some additional webinar mm -hmm. learning opportunities to address those. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over. Um, Jonathan Wheeler is with me. He's from the South Carolina Department of Health and Environmental Control. And of course, of course, AFTO's um, our own Joe, Joe Corby, who's been uh, with AFTO for a long time and he's still doing special projects. So here he is again. Um, and I'm gonna turn it over to Joe to get started. Thank you, Brooke. Uh, as Brooke said, this was a three-year effort. Boy, that is a <clears throat> was a long period of time. But John and I spoke with and collaborated with an awful lot of people, important people, uh, in in order to put this document together for you. And I think as we start, John and I would like to acknowledge some of the people, particularly those that were in our primary uh, work work group. Uh, let me introduce the, the three uh, regulatory members that John and I work with on, on the work group. We recognize that it was critical to get uh, local agency input on this. And we had two young ladies who were really major contributors and gave us really the insights from, from the local perspective. We had Felissa Vasquez, who's with Buncombe County, Health Department in North Carolina. Uh, Phyllis is also, I want to say, a, uh, a fellow with, uh, from the IFPTI Fellowship as well. And also Melissa Ham, who's with the Hope County Local Health Department in North Carolina. And, and these two young ladies really presented a lot of critical information and important insight from local health agencies to the work group. Additionally, we had James Topey from Minnesota Department of Health. Uh, I know I recognize that Minnesota, both the health department and agriculture is really, they've really have been progressive in dealing with specialized processes. 
and we knew Jim would be uh, an important person, person to have on this work group. I'm going to let John acknowledge the academia members who contributed to this project. John? Okay. So for some of the aspects of this guide, we realized that it would be really important to pull in uh, some academic sources uh, to provide the detailed information we wanted to provide. Uh, first of all, we worked with Dr. Dana Hansen from NC State University. Uh, he wrote a large percentage of the section on meat preservation and curing processes. Uh, we needed to make sure that that covered a lot more than just making sausage or dry fermented sausages. Uh, we wanted to make sure that there were a number of whole muscle curing processes represented as well. And we felt like he did a really great, he was a great resource for that. Uh, we also worked with Dr. Ellen Shoemaker and Dr. Ben Chapman uh, from NC State uh, to put together the section on acidification and fermentation processes. Uh, we're all pretty familiar with acidification, direct, you know, pickling type processes, but fermentation is one that I think we all find challenging. And uh, worldwide, as, as much as 40% of all foods are fermented. So uh, we needed, I, I have some customers here in South Carolina dealing with mold fermentation. So we needed to make sure we covered a lot more, uh, provided a lot more guidance in the area of fermentation than what we've had available in the past. Uh, we also worked with Dr. Jonathan Campbell at Penn State University specifically to validate uh, the HACCP templates that we're providing. Um, we wanted them available in a generic format, but this representative of the processes that we needed to address. Uh, and again, keeping in mind that they are designed to be adapted to each establishment's particular process. Uh, so they represent each one that we've provided represents a generic version of the particular process. And then last but not least, we also worked with Dr. Evelyn Watts from Louisiana State University, I'll uh, see Grant, on the section for hot smoking of fish for preservation. Joe will uh, talk with us uh, further about uh, you know, the additional input we had from uh, federal uh, and other state and local jurisdictions. Yeah, we really had <clears throat> widespread review of this document as we went through these this three-year effort. <clears throat> uh, we utilized committees in AFTO, uh, we utilize the uh, retail consortium uh, to get not just comments. We also received some criticisms and um, uh, we did get a lot of recommendations and, and we, you know, we, we took, we imported these comments and recommendations in, into the document. And we cannot forget FDA. FDA really provided some very strong comments for us that, that we accepted. And, and while we were doing this over the three year period, if we had an issue or a question about the food code and how to apply to one of these, we always relied on some of the uh, retail food specialists that we knew who would answer questions for us as we went through this. But as we got near the end, we asked the FDA retail food, food uh, protection branch to review it. In addition, some experts from FDA on HACCP, and they really provided us some strong comments that we imported into the document. So we got a lot of, lot of input from, from state and local regulators and FDA as well. Uh, John, you wanted, to, you wanted to thank the AFTO production team, I think, uh, as yes. well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the AFTA work group, uh, you know, collaborated um, for several months with Brooke uh, and with her team, um, Paula Barber and Penny Dawson. They did not rest until this publication was, uh, you know, completed and the quality you see here, they did a fantastic job polishing this up and, and getting it ready for publication. So, Joe? Yeah, I, I guess we should start in, in with the document, you know, the purpose of the document. What, what the guidance document is, is kind of a, a compendium of all of these resources that we were able to obtain from academia, from uh, 
from the FDA food code and, and a number of other resources. Uh, and we believe it's, it will be a great resource, not just for regulators, but also for industry. And in particular, I think uh, small businesses who, you know, maybe are curing some meats or smoking some meats or have cook chill or sous vide, that they can use this document to, to help them uh, get a team together, develop a HACCP plan and, and comply with the, with the requirements. Uh, it's also, I think, a great resource for those individuals that have the real burden of reviewing these HACCP plans and approving them. Do you know the food code requires that uh, regulatory authority must approve these HACCP plans. That's, that's a big burden. That's an important burden. And we're hopeful that this guidance document uh, can help these individuals or these teams review plans and, and, and approve them. We've made every effort to make this guidance document as, as clear as possible and, and create a format that was easy to use. And Brooke said I would show you the document with the tabs. We have, we have these uh, uh, laminated tabs for the 10 sections and the three appendixes. So it's, it's easy to go to the section you want to deal with if it's reduce oxygen packaging or if you want to know about hazards, you can, you can go to the booklet uh, where, where it's tabbed. Remember that this is for retail uh, and not for the larger commercial processors or manufacturers. This is strictly for those retail establishments that are conducting special processes and require HACCP plans and compliance with, with variances. First thing we did, or one of the first things we did as we developed this was to find out the feeling, the, the needs, and to get the insights from, from regulators. Uh, and we conducted, AFTO conducted for us a survey of the states, which uh, John has given speeches, you know, in a number of places around the country about. So John's going to talk about the survey that was conducted for us. Okay, let me, let me share my screen. Oops. Okay, um, so first of all, our methodology, um, we. The survey went to all 50 state jurisdictions. Our focus was on regulatory challenges as well as the resources that are being used in those jurisdictions. And then we also wanted to find out what challenges are being encountered uh, when it comes to implementation of the HACCP plans in the retail establishments. Uh, we had two response formats, either a yes or a no, and then uh, on a scale of one to five, where one means we need help, five means we are proficient. Uh, so that was how we assessed the uh, results. So I'm, what I'm showing you here on two slides is a summary of the key results. Um, in particular, at the top, there were three results that uh, uh, kind of summarize the assessment of Relative, perceived strength of each special process program. Uh, the overall strength of the program, um, the various uh, scores came in to an average of 3.62, or basically 72.5%. If you think about that, uh, you know, like you're getting a test back in school and it's graded on a 70 to 70% uh, 70 passing scale, that's not a very uh, encouraging score. And then when you put that together with two of the other questions, uh, the ability, you know, what we asked the respondents to uh, assess their ability to provide assistance to another jurisdiction if, if they need, if they were called on to help. Uh, only four, uh, the score there was uh, 4.1 on average from 31 respondents. Um, 
And then a result that particularly uh, we found troubling was that with that 72.5% confidence score, 13 out of 31 respondents, uh, 13 out of 31 states indicated that inspectors are approving HACCP plans in the field. And that raised a serious question uh, amongst our work group uh, to, to be concerned with, you know, what is the level of expertise? Uh, we're dealing with high-risk processes here. Uh, and especially when we're talking about fermentation processes or meat preservation, there are a lot of moving, moving parts in those processes and how much expertise really uh, is being used to actually look at the details of these HACCP plans. So we broke down the responses uh, by individual process categories uh, with requesting additional responses. So two key questions. We feel like we need more training and we could provide assistance to other states. And what you see here are the uh, affirmative responses to each of those questions by process category. So, you know, eight and 10 and eight and eight, uh, 12 out of 31, we never saw any high scores. So when you put those responses at the top in that context, the picture gets even more troubling. Uh, continuing uh, those responses for the additional for the uh, individual processes. Um, again, you know, none of these were just blowing out the top of the scoring possibilities. Uh, you know, the scores were very troubling to uh, to see how low those scores were. So, based on this information, uh, there were some additional comments and questions. Um, and the responses we've provided here. Number one, 28 out of 31 jurisdictions indicated they would be interested in seeing templates. Uh, some of those indicated that they already have some templates, uh, but they indicated interest in seeing others. So, so a total of 28 out of 31, that's 90%. Uh, the trainings that are being used in these various jurisdictions, uh, we summarized those here. FD312, the special processes at retail course, only 11 out of 31 indicated that they are, are using that course. It's a little bit surprising. Um, two jurisdictions indicated that they have used uh, North Carolina State's course validation and verification of HACCP at retail, two out of 31. One indicated that they had used the HACCP course from the University of uh, Nebraska. Uh, and then uh, I'll just give a nod to our former program manager here, uh, my own background with HACCP manager and seafood and juice HACCP, uh, as well as a PCQI. Uh, I've, been in, I've been in HACCP world for close to 25 years. Another question uh, was, do we feel that the retail persons in charge, or the chefs or whoever we're dealing with, do we feel that they need HACCP training provided at their level, putting that question another way, do we feel that university type house of courses are meeting the needs of our retail constituents? Uh, and the answer was 15 out of 31. This is from state jurisdictions. Uh, in particular on this question, we felt that uh, at the local level, uh, that probably would be a lower score. Specialized training for regulatory staff, is it needed? Uh, 22 out of 31 responded, yes, uh, we definitely need more in specialized training. Uh, similar response, more comprehensive guidance materials are needed, 24 out of 31. Nine out of 31 indicated that a mentorship program of some sort would be beneficial, where jurisdictions if they have a question, could contact a mentor or you know a group of mentors to receive assistance. And that is a good summary, I think, of the uh, survey results. And this is what drove our work in developing this guidance, uh, as well as the um, additional materials uh, that we developed to go along alongside of the guide. Joe? Yeah, I think it's time we get into the guidance document. We want to you know, go through fairly quickly 
the sections that that exist to give you, you know, some understanding of, of, of what is what is in there. Um, like anything else, before you begin anything, you need to get your ducks in order. Uh, I think John and I both remember when HACCP was first introduced to the regulatory community and to to the food industry. Uh, a lot of individuals felt, well, we'll just grab one of these model HACCP plans that FSIS has or uh, other resources had, and and that was it. And that was was their HACCP plan. Well, it doesn't work like that. At the first four sections of of the uh, document really deal with the the introduction and kind of the preliminary stuff that really needs to be done before you actually get into the development. This is actually the first part of, of the development. Uh, uh, and, and it's really necessary. It deals with, you know, first of all, knowing which processes require a HACCP plan and which ones require uh, a variance. Uh, you know, the section talks about the roles of of processing authorities if, if they are used, any authorities and responsibilities of the regulatory community as well. We also have a host of definitions uh, that you can refer back to as you go through the guidance document. Uh, there's talk about the prerequisite programs that are required. That's not only in the early sections, but also in section nine, and we'll get to that uh, in a little bit. And then it talks about the preliminary steps that are needed uh, as you develop your HACCP plan, things like forming the, the, the HACCP team, making sure you have the right individuals involved in a HACCP team. It talks about developing a process flow diagram uh, of the process and all the ingredients that, that uh, are included in that process and who is going to verify that, that process. Uh, a flow diagram. Um, it talks about uh, monitoring procedures that are needed, corrective actions. Uh, it talks about all of the principles of, of HACCP. So, so somebody who may not be familiar with the systematic approach that, that HACCP is, it goes through the, the seven principles of HACCP so you can understand that. And it also uh, talks about the general food requirements relative to variances and half of plans. So the first four sections actually just deal with kind of the preliminary things you need to know or you need to do as you develop your, your HACCP of plan. But then the fun begins after those four sections as we get into the specific processes. And John's gonna do section five which is reduce oxygen packaging. Okay. But throughout the guide, you, we had to make every effort to make the information as easy as possible to understand for us non-scientists with no HACCP knowledge, because that is what we're typically dealing with uh, within the retail community, especially those that are not part of national chains. Uh, I can tell you here in South Carolina, we're dealing with these processes everywhere from country stores to high-end restaurants and everything in between. So we have to make it as, as easy to grasp as possible uh, for those folks that do not have the science background, they don't have any HACCP training. So first of all, we talked about the, um, in the ROP process, the special requirements for ROP for different categories of foods. Uh, we give a description of what the term ROP means. What is an ROP package? Uh, there's a linked clarification document from FDA uh, that provides more information on what constitutes an ROP package and what does not. Uh, there's some discussion as well of non-oxygen barrier films. There is a difference. Um, reduced oxygen packaging prevents oxygen from entering the package through that film. Uh, there are some non-oxygen barrier films out there as well, and we provide a discussion on that topic. Uh, we covered the primary hazards in ROP packaging, uh, as well as the food code requirements. Uh, again, those food code requirements in the ROP section 3-50212 <clears throat> are validated. So they should not need additional validation. That's a very important point to keep on in mind 
because in writing those HACCP plans, if they follow those criteria in the food code, no further validation should be required uh, unless there's going to be something else throwing a twist in there that requires a variance. And that's where you would have to uh, look at a different citation under 3502.11 and uh, assess those additional controls to make sure that they are validated. We provided a lot of additional discussion on sous vide cooking uh, because of the fact that that is a very specialized technique. Uh, it is very uh, sensitive to um, particular details such as making sure that the portions that are being cooked at one time are of uniform thickness and weight. Um, there's additional important detail that needs to be considered when you're cook sous vide uh, large roasts or hams. Uh, so we've provided a lot of additional information on uh, the specifications for the process when we're dealing with large batches, uh, large roasts, and so on, um, as well as the alternate times and temperatures, which are commonly requested with sous vide processes. So in connection with that, we have to talk about process hazards, uh, and that is covered in, in the guide. Uh, we provided coverage on reduced oxygen packaging with fish and with cheeses. Uh, and then we provide examples of ROP applications which require a variance uh, in which Clostridium botulinum and Listeria are controlled by methods other than those prescribed in 350212. Uh, and then there's also some coverage of products that uh, can be ROP'd without a HACCP plan. In the next section, uh, we cover the preservation of proteins. Uh, sometimes that's not a curing process uh, in the regulatory sense, but it is nonetheless a preservation process. Uh, Dr. Hansen uh, covered a large chunk of this for us uh, on the cured meats. Uh, he provided uh, some great detail on smoking processes, the equalization time to make sure the cure is uniformly distributed throughout the meat, whether it's a roast or whether it's you know, like pork bellies or smaller pieces. Uh, he also provided coverage on the humidity controls that are required in fermentation processes, uh, as well as in the cooking and aging steps for those large pieces like hams. Uh, there's coverage on fermented dry sausages, such as salamis and pepperonis. Uh, as well as semi-dry sausage, uh, your summer sausages, such as servalat and mortadella. There's extensive coverage on cured and cooked or dried whole muscle products, such as bacon, uh, cooked hams, country hams that are prepared with no cook step, uh, as well as pancetta, pastrami, and similar products. A lot of, a lot of different categories there, and we needed more coverage, and we've provided that. Uh, there is coverage of different curing agents, including mm -hmm. the nitrite, uh, sodium or potassium nitrite, as well as uh, the nitrates and curing accelerators, uh, which are in some cases required along with the nitrate and nitrite. And then there is a summary of various product types uh, for those curing processes. We also have a section on jerky. Um, covering the various details, including humidity controls that are required, uh, specifications that should be used to make sure the jerky is dried uniformly. And this one I hope will be very popular, uh, calculations for, for verifying that the cure is used in a legal ratio. I say legal because the cure uh, using nitrite and nitrate is regulated under Title IX. Uh, and the calculations, if you've ever looked at the FSIS uh, inspector, or processing inspector's calculation handbook, you probably mm -hmm. need a bottle of Tylenol, right? We've developed a spreadsheet, had it validated both by Dr. Campbell at Penn State, uh, as well as Dr. Hansen at NC State. Uh, and that spreadsheet is available on the AFTA website, uh, at the uh, page that has been shared. It will greatly simplify the process of doing those calculations, uh, and it provides the legal limits for the cure and for the uh, cure accelerators for each of the types of process uh, that are represented. Five total process types represented each for both the cure number one with nitrite only, uh, and then the cure number two with nitrate and nitrite. 
Again, the process hazards are covered in detail. We've also provided a section on a dry aging of beef. This is something that is uh, becoming very popular, especially in high-end restaurants. Um, there are safety guidelines needed, which we provided. Um, so I uh, just want you to be aware of that because the question, if you haven't already heard it sooner or later, you may have that question presented to you. We have a section on preserv preservation of fish by hot smoking and drying. Uh, it's a lot of great information there. Uh, and then there's also some information on it. observations that you may make during an inspection that would be helpful in identifying uh, meat preservation processes. Joe, I'll hand it off to you. Yeah, I think the uh, reduced oxygen packaging, which includes uh, cook chill and sous vide, and also uh, the section dealing with uh, the curing and or smoking of meat, poultry, and fish are probably the, the two two most common processes that are, are seen at retail and, and ones that the, the, uh, uh, the state people that were surveyed were interested in, in learning more, more about. But section seven deals with all those other, other specialized processes that, that you may, may bump into. And it, and it you know, simply provides some of the, the controls that, that you should be aware of if, if you deal with these particular special processes. <clears throat> One of them is the molluscan shellfish tanks. And you know, the required controls for those tanks, whether it's the temperature control, the filtration that exists, in, in the water treatment, is the, uh, the UV treatment for disinfecting the, uh, the water. So that's that's included in section seven. And then there's a, a bigger section on the direct acidification. And that's uh, becoming more and more common uh, in uh, these retail establishments. There's acidification that is employed not for preservation. You think of a product like uh, ceviche, which is fish or shellfish that's marinated with uh, citric, citric juices and spices. It's primarily for, for flavor and not for preservation. Then you have the direct acidification that is for refrigeration or for preservation purposes. And I think it references in there cold brine pickles that you may, may bump, bump into. And it talks about the use of additives in a lot of these products, the employment of citric acid into a product, ascorbic acid, potassium sorbate, those particular additives that can, um, you know, change the, uh, the risk associated with some of these foods. And then there's the fermentation processes. And as John says, this is growing. This is becoming more and more popular. And we reference in section seven, three types of fermentations. There's the, the vegetable fermentations, think of uh, sauerkraut or think of kimchi, kimchi, which is has become more and more popular. Those are discussed, the controls for those are discussed in, in section seven. Then you have the dairy fermentations, yogurt, Yogurt, kefir are two examples. Those are addressed. And then there's the mold fermentations, which uh, are, are perhaps not as common as some of the other ones. Mold fermentations are typically used with soybean products like, like miso, which is a, a soybean paste that, that is produced, um, or tempeh, which is a fermented soybean. Um, and that can contain additional grains or, or beans. So those are addressed as well. And then there's discussion on the sprouting at retail and the controls relative to the uh, disinfection of seeds uh, and the handling of the water and irrigating the water that is used to, to for where these steep or these, uh, uh, these, uh, uh, Sprouts are, are included in the water that is used. There's, there's a portion 
in the section on bottling juices, whether it's a five log reduction that is employed or whether it is a warning label that is employed. And then there's additional information about cold press juices, which seems to be a new and innovative process, which is now becoming in existence in some of these retail establishments. And then there's custom processing and the controls that need to be employed, included in your HACCP plan for custom processing, whether it's the segregated storage of, of products, whether it's sanitation, and, and then of course the not for sale labeling. And then there's kind of my favorite section, which we throw under the category as other, because special processes are ever changing. We are always bumping into products. We don't know what the heck they are. We go into a lot of these ethnic food stores and you see these products and I don't know what this, this, this stuff is. And, and these other processes are where regulatory authorities who don't know much about them can require a HASA plan and variance for these products to be produced. And there's, again, there are a lot of these specialty products you bump into or simply go into an ethnic food store. And if they're producing products that you may not be aware of, that's covered under this other category for specialized processes. The big thing, as you recall from the survey, John talked about was the templates. And sections eight, nine, and 10 deal with templates uh, records and logs that uh, we are making avail available for you. So John's going to talk about the process uh, types of templates that we make available for you. Thank you, Joe. Yeah, I appreciate uh, that Joe mentioned those other processes that are, uh, you know, kind of off the chain that come in, and I see those pretty much every week, sometimes several times a week. I hope that uh, you will. Uh, I hope that you had the opportunity to listen to the Advanced Inspector Boot Camp last Thursday on the 22nd. Uh, Dr. Baker and I uh, covered that particular topic featuring that section from out of this guide on assessing those unfamiliar processes. Uh, that's what I call the, uh, uh, the catch-all clause. Uh, the recording is now available on the AFTO uh, Boot Camp uh, webpage. I would uh, de definitely refer you to that. Uh, uh, so we had a lot of fun with that. Uh, so one of the biggest asks from the AFTO survey was for HACCP templates. Uh, the use of templates uh, to provide guidance on specific required information for a process type is a major benefit to retail operators. It helps them to complete their HACCP plan. We need to be able to provide that guidance. Uh, it is a time saver, both for those retail operators as well as for regulators. Uh, and if you've dealt with these guys as they're struggling through writing a HACCP plan, you will hear frustration. But when we can provide them detailed guidance on exactly what type of information they must provide, it, it absolutely facilitates that process. Using a template also provides a checklist for those of you who are charged with reviewing those plans to, to do a pre-approval of the plan. Uh, those checklists are invaluable. Each of the templates we've provided represents a generic um, assumed process, and it needs to be adapted to each establishment's specific process details. So if they've got a couple steps flipped from the order that's there in the template, then we have to address that. Or, you know, let's say they're ROPing raw beef and pork, but they also want to include fish. That calls for some modifications where we have to insert some alternate instructions for freezing the fish before it's packaged and removing it from the package uh, before it is thawed. So those are examples of how, how you could modify the template to a particular process. Lastly, and I would say most importantly, two points. Uh, the hazard analysis in each template covers both the raw material hazards and the process hazards for the, for the assumed process. We know in sous vide cooking, there's uh, a lot of times they're gonna wanna use cook low and slow. 
Okay, well, that does not provide a kill step for viruses. So we have to talk about the employee health and hygiene controls. We also have to talk about, uh, you know, sanitation controls. If you get contamination on the outside of the bag, it can end up on, on the product when you open the bag. Uh, if you're doing fermentation processes, you do not have a kill step for viruses. So we have to talk about that. And the other point here is that these templates provide a teaching tool for us as regulators. We need to educate the person in charge about those significant hazards that dictate required controls in these high-risk processes. We need to remember that the retail operators don't have HACCP training, so we need to educate as we regulate. That is absolutely critical. So we believe that this guide uh, and these templates will be very helpful uh, in this respect. Uh, so I would highly recommend using the guide uh, as well as the templates as, a, as teaching tools as much as a resource. So I'm just gonna touch on a few, a few of those templates. What did I just do? Um, ROP storage uh, for raw meats and poultry uh, that can be modified, for example, for butcher shops that are not cooking product, they're just packaging the product to sell to consumers. Uh, or it can be used in a restaurant where the end product is going to be cooked. Why is the cooking step important? Because if anything happened to the product as it was being processed and packaged, we have to know that there is a cook step. That is the final step at which we would destroy that bacterial contamination. So that, that's, that is part of our thinking there is uh, all the way from start to finish of the, of the particular process, getting it to the consumer. I'm not gonna read all of these, uh, just a few of them that I wanted to highlight. I mentioned about the sous vide cooking. There's a lot of great information on the guide on that topic. Uh, we have templates for cured and cooked whole muscles such as pastrami and bacon. Uh, as well as curing and drying of whole muscles, such as uh, country hams, pork bellies, uh, prosciutto. Uh, the next one I wanted to touch on is uh, for canning or bottling of acidified or acidic foods. Uh, so that can include products such as you know pickles, barbecue sauce, salsas, relishes, chutneys, um, you know hot sauces that uh, use a direct acidification process. Uh, and then fermenting vegetables. Again, some of the pickles are um, fermented rather than a direct acidification process. Uh, hot sauces, again, a lot of those are fermented products. Uh, there's a lot of other categories that, that could use that template, um, potentially with some modification. Uh, so that's where, again, the guide can help you with those necessary modifications when the need arises. And then at the end of this section, we've also provided some general guidance on labeling and date marking requirements, including the specifics from the, the food code, as well as uh, some particulars that you may need to, uh, to help you deal with um, you know, special process products. Joe? Yeah, I'm gonna talk about the um, prerequisite program templates um, that we're, we make available to to you in, in the guidance document. And for each of these includes instructions for them, for the use of them, where they should be used, how, how they should be used. And then we have blank templates. If you wanna download or take the blank template for use in, in, in the product that you're developing, uh, that is perfectly all right. So we have, example of a sanitation standard operating procedure, an SSOP, uh, and again, a template for that. Again, that's something you need to do upfront before you even start to develop your HAZA plan is to have an SSOP. There's templates that can relate to controlling employee hygiene and habits, kind of a record that you can use. Same with them, food employee health, and that's really a, a tough one uh, to determine whether there are any health issues with your employees that that, uh, that come into work. And, and we have, again, instructions and a template that you can use for, for that purpose. And you all know that training is so, so critical for, for this uh, type of work. 
and we have a template that you can use to uh, record the training that, that you are doing. And then finally, the HACCP plan verification and maintenance. This, this is something that industry certainly would, would need to use. And that includes covering things like the routine verification procedures that are conducted, the annual reassessment of the, of the HACCP plan, and any calibration procedures such as calibrating pH meters or, or thermometers. Again, that is all explained and templates are available to you for that, uh, that particular function. And then the last section John's gonna talk about are the records and monitoring logs. So I'm, I'm not going to read the list, but uh, there are examples of 20 different types of monitoring logs and batch records. Um, so you know some of these are a very standard um, conventional format, the hazard analysis worksheet, the HACCP summary table, uh, which mm -hmm. may also be called a CCP audit table or a, a HACCP summary, HACCP audit table. Uh, but then we have you know, batch logs, for example, for reduced oxygen packaging, uh, which includes a uh, verification you know, column that the label was, was correct when it was applied. Um, you know, some of the batch logs, uh, for example, um, acidified foods or uh, cured and cooked whole muscle, um, fermented sausage batch log, uh, jerky log, uh, hot smoking fish. All of these, um, you know, gather the necessary information for the particular details that need to be recorded and documented. What I would point out about these is that um, they provide the necessary, the, the format provides the necessary information. Other formats would be perfectly acceptable as, as long as the required information is there. And that includes electronic <laughs> records. Uh, one of the big pushbacks that I hear constantly is, you know, paper is no friend to the restaurant kitchen. Uh, man, this is a lot of paperwork. There are electronic solutions out there that, out there that can simplify the record keeping. As long as it provides the necessary information and a secure, uh, you know, secure document that can't be tampered with, that should be acceptable. Should be perfectly acceptable. So again, uh, you know, these are good examples, uh, and there can be others as well. Uh, we see, uh, for example, a discard log that doesn't necessarily uh, support the HACCP plan, depending how it's referenced in the plan, but certainly it, it can be included. Um, and we see those from time to time. Uh, food safety audit form. Uh, again, we have some restaurants that do that on a regular basis and they provide that form. We don't necessarily require that, but it can certainly be acceptable. So Joe, I'll hand it over to you to wrap this up. Yeah, the last three sections are actually the appendixes um, that are really helpful resources. And, and a lot of these we, Took out of the food code, FDA food code, uh, we got from academia and, and a number of other resources uh, that we make uh, available for you. The first appendix are the food and process hazards, and you know it's a, a list of the biological hazards that that you need to address, chemical hazards, and physical hazards. So that appendix covers those. We also have charts in there that identify the growth requirements and preventive measures for, for, for pathogens. Uh, and again, I, I wanna state that there's a number of sources that we, we contacted to, to get uh, this information. So appendix one deals with the hazards. Uh, appendix two uh, is a list of common questions and answers. And this thing will, it will be fluid and continually evolve. Uh, I know we're getting a, a number of questions here on, on freeze-dried and spray-dried products. Uh, we'll talk about that just a little bit uh, on what we'll do with, with that. That's kind of one of those products that all of a sudden appeared and where does it fall into? Does it need a has a plan and so forth? But as we get these questions, we can incorporate it into this document as you know it, it expands and again it being very fluid. So appendix two are the current questions 
and answers that we have that we have incorporated in there. And Appendix 3 is really just examples of three passive plans. Uh, we've learned from the past, you gotta be careful with these model HACCP plans that individuals will just take it and say, well, that sounds like my product, I'll use that. And it doesn't really work like that, but we do uh, provide three HACCP plans uh, in this document. And the first one are the dried cured hams, pork shoulders, and pork bellies. The second one are the uh, dry cured bacon. And the third one is non-heat treated, shelf stable, fermented salami, fermented sausage. So those HACCP plans or models of HACCP plans are provided for you. So I wanna, wanted to mention that we're getting a number of questions on, on freeze drying and spray drying of products. I really don't have a lot of expertise on that, but we will get back to these individuals. In fact, I see in one place, an individual has said that they would help us with this. Apparently they have some uh, expertise in these products. We will be contacting you for, for assistance. I don't know, as John knows about freeze drying or spray drying. So we will answer all of your questions that exist in chat and get back to all of you uh, individuals. We wanna know what more do you want to know about special pro specialized processes? Because we'll, we'll get people together such as this individual on freeze drying, if we do something on that, academia, FDA, we'll get individuals that have expertise on these particular products and we will consider doing webinars for you. So please fill out that uh, survey sheet that will be sent out to you. And I think, Brooke, I think you're gonna talk a little bit about that or close this thing out. Well, Joe, thank you and John too. Um, I just, I worked on this project and I know the blood and sweat and tears that you and the work, work group put in on it. One of the things I wanted to mention was that Amy has provided not only the link to buy the guide, the one thing that's nice about the guide that sh Joe showed is they're $99, but they are built to last. They're laminated and it, it makes a great, um, great asset to be using. You can download the guide for free. And that's at the same location that was posted in the chat. In addition, the templates and the sample templates are located at a link that is on that page. We encourage you to tell us what's missing. And if there's something that doesn't work for you, please let us know by contacting us at afto at afto.org and mentioning the HACCP guide. Um, Joe and John, do you have anything else you want to say? I'm Ryan. seeing a lot of great questions. I, I think we could probably go on for a good bit longer, but uh, we've just got a few minutes. Um, uh, but thank you all for your listening. Thank you for these questions. Um, uh, I'm just looking to see if, do I have time to answer a couple of them? Brooke? Joe, Joe, you're on Joe. mute. And John, yes, we have okay. we have six minutes left. Okay, uh, so I see one uh, just came in about sous vide fish products. Um, there's a lot that can be said about that, but uh, what I would say is, and this is based on science, um, we have to keep in mind time and temperature. Time is critical here. Um, if the fish is packaged and then immediately cooked in the sous vide bath and then immediately removed, you have greatly limited time. There's not time enough there for CBOT to multiply and produce toxin to a harmful level. Uh, we're talking about just a very short time, maybe an hour or so. So uh, that could be done. That would require variance. I would put that under 350211D, where the CBOT and Listeria are controlled by other methods. 
So that that is a distinct and that is a good example of where we have to think about the process. We have to think about time and temperature in particular, um, and realize that yes, if we use a different method to control those pathogens, it can actually be done, but it does require variance because we're substituting a control for the standard control that's provided by the food code. I think uh, maybe. I, I just want to say, I think John and I, after this, will get together on some of these, these other things that some of them would be easy to answer. Some of them we'll have to do a little research on. Um, but I see there are several products that have been identified uh, in addition to, to the freeze drying and spray drying products. There's a... What you think? Yeah, I, I see one, Joe, that caught my eye, sourdough oh. and injera. Yeah. Uh, that was, the, the injera was a question that came up um, coming out of the uh, boot camp webinar last last Thursday. Uh, injera is a primarily a lacto-fermentation, lactic acid bacteria, um, uh, similar to producing dosa um, and nan, if you're familiar with those. All of these three um, particular fermentations produce a batter that is then used to produce a fried flat uh, flatbread or pancake type product. Um, the general criteria there in any fer fermentation process is to quickly reduce the pH to below 5.3 to prevent staph from producing toxin. Uh, but then, you know, you, you want to continue to bring that pH down uh, certainly to less than 4.6. Generally, it should be less than 4.2. Uh, but then keep in mind, there is a subsequent frying step that uh, is also protective. Um, so injera and sourdough are not specifically included, but the general guidance is there in that section on fermentation. Uh, and I will be, Dr. Baker and I will be providing answers to those questions from the boot camp presentation uh, some point in the next few days. And again, there's some, go there's ahead. questions about a uh, flow chart. I, I believe the, the, the section on the uh, preliminary section talks about flow charts. And, and, and I believe there is one that it, that is shown that, that you can go to. There's somebody says they're confused about which, which processes require a plan and no variance or require a variance. I believe we have addressed that in there. So that should, uh, look like should be helpful for that particular individual. There's a question about cold cold brewed coffee, which is new. You know, we had one here in New York, I believe was actually recalled for potential botulism concern. Uh, some of these things, we will get back to each of you in a, an email to you uh, and hopefully to address this or tell you where you can get information to, to address this. And again, the individual who would like to speak on freeze drying, I, I do hope that we do contact him or her and, uh, and use that individual's expertise. Yes, absolutely, so, I agree. So, so Joe, one of the things we talked about, which I think is a great idea, is answering the questions, but providing it to everybody who's on today's webinar because okay. there may be others than just the one person who asked the question. So be Good watching idea. watching your email, and then we'll also put that, um, that information on the page with the templates as well. So it's got a permanent residence on the APTO website. I think that's great. I think it's a great idea. We just had somebody check in and say they've got expertise on cold brewing coffee. So. This is what it's all about, is getting the expertise from all over the regulatory community and, and elsewhere to address these issues and then share them. And that's what we're trying to do. Absolutely. But you've done a great job of putting, putting the skeleton together so that people can put the meat on it in addition to what you've already prepared. Thank you. I really Thank you appreciate it. I appreciate the time, John and Joe, and everyone who's on the webinar. Please look in your email for the survey and the opportunity to tell us what you want to know more about.
And with that, thank you so much, John and Joe, and um, thank you to everybody in attendance. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Have a great day, everybody.